All right, hello everybody and welcome to my talk about polyglot persistence and which data model to pick for your workload. My name is Gerald Fenzel, I'm a senior principal product manager for Oracle. So I hope all of you have actually already heard about polyglot persistence. It's a term that was coined by Martin Fowler, or certainly folks like him uh, in the early 2010s where he famously said up there from his page, the future is not NoSQL databases anymore, it's polyglot persistence. And really what he said was, well, actually you should have the choice in the data persistence layer or the data persistence technology that you should choose for your workload, for your data. And of course we all understood that, right? The picture looked great. We all were like, yeah, yeah, makes sense. And we ran off and did this. We basically said, hey, that's our excuse to just get one of everything, right? And then of course, as we put more and more things in place, people were like, hey, what data do we actually store? Can anybody answer this question for us? And then we did this, basically said, hey, it's not me, it's the data science division that you have to talk to, right? We don't care. But actually the talk is not so much about that, but more of the fact that one important uh, one important point that's missing in there. And that's actually the format or the data model that is used by those different store techno storage technologies and the choice that we developers have to make in how we want to model our data. So in that picture there, we have essentially two key value stores. We have a JSON document store, we have a, a graph store, and then we have something that looks tabular. Not necessarily relational, there were relational databases there, but Cassandra sort of also looks tabular or white column of family as they used to call it. And this is really what I want to focus on quickly in those th 13 minutes that I have left. The four data models that pretty much is like 99% of the, the use cases that we have today are, are structured in one of, uh, one of these. So it's key value, which is an arbitrary value that is identified by a unique key, very simple. Documents, which is JSON, as well as XML and anything else that's a hierarchical and self-contained document that we can store information in. Not PDF or Word, some people confuse this, especially in the business side. Relational, I think that's probably the most common or mo most used one out there, right? Because we have it since a long, long time. Table rows and columns, the restructuring tables and then relate to each other. And then graphs, which are nodes and relationships between nodes. And of course, and there's a couple of others, but again, as I said, 99% of the use cases today, you will have one of those uh, will be sufficient. Let's jump right in. Key value, very simple. You have basically only two entities, a key value pair, a key that's something uniquely identifiable, and a value, which can be pretty much anything. So it could be a string with my name, it could be a hash, it could be a JSON document in itself, it could be a picture, an audio format, or whatever. It doesn't really matter, because what key value essentially does is it stores the value as a byte array. So this is what you will put down on disk, and therefore it doesn't matter what you actually store in there. You just give that technology a byte array and say, please store those bytes on disk. What are the benefits and the downside of key value? Well, first and foremost is you can store anything. That's really, really nice about it because it's just byte arrays. You, the application or the developer has to tell it, okay, here is something, those are bytes, put it down. Whether that is an image or whether that is a JSON document or anything else, does not matter to the technology. There's another big benefit that some people tend to forget all the time about that though. Putting bytes on disk or in memory and reading it back from disk or memory is actually the fastest possible method that you can do, right? Disks just store bytes on a magnetic spindle and same in memory, you just put bytes essentially down on DRAM. So that's the most efficient way how you can put some structured data, some form of data down on disk and read it again. Because you don't have anything else associated. The application just says bytes, store it. It will say yes, done, stored. And it's also very nice and easy to adopt new data sources, especially if the format is different. So today you store JSON documents, tomorrow a picture comes along, fine, you just store it. The day after audio format comes along, fine, you just store it, because again, you just store bytes on disk. Downsides of it, it is the lowest common denominator, right, bytes. So that means basically whatever application is reading that data, it has to understand what the bytes actually resemble. If you read the picture back, it has to understand, okay, those bytes is actually a JPEG or something like that. It's easy if it's the same application to put the data down, not so easy if it's a different application to try to actually make sense out of that data. And that also means it's complex to analyze, right, because you essentially have to uh, all the uh, methods that you get more or less with key value stores is put and get, write it, read it. And you have some mechanisms of filtering, like do key ranges and so forth. But essentially, if you want to aggregate across that or filter across that, you have to build all of this in the application tier. Now, what are the usages for that? Well, whenever you want the fastest possible read or write of a single value that's something, that's what you want to go for. 
If you don't want to have any restrictions on what you can want to store, that's what you go for. And if the new data uh, source formats aren't known yet, so you don't want to have to extend all the time your data model or something like that just because you want to store a new format. Examples, typical examples, IoT. That's basically hits all of those, right? It's like you have some arbitrary data coming along at high speed and you just want to absorb it. Or well, same with caches, HTTP caches and so forth. Where you don't really want to use it, well, anything where you want to do sophisticated analysis on the data that you have. Usually what will happen, you will just take all the data, put it somewhere else, and then actually start analyzing it over there. Or anything where the format is well known and doesn't and is very repetitive, but you actually don't care about the performance, so you can take them time to, to put it down. You probably don't want to use key value there because you, again, go to the lowest common denominator. And if you have many applications that want to read the data, because, again, they all have to understand what those bytes actually resemble. Next one is documents, right? JSON documents. Everybody knows this, right? Same concept there, same data there, just modeled differently into JSON. We have, again, some attributes and values associated with that. The picture now is a base64 instead of a binary image. And we have this hierarchical document, right? We have actually a document within a document, the location in there now is actually just an object uh, within the JSON document itself. Same thing you could do with XML. Since, you know, ever, but that's so 2001, we're not going to go there. People kind of just always tend to forget that XML is also hierarchical documents. But anyway, benefits and downsides of that. Well, big benefit, it's self-contained. Data and metadata is stored alongside with it in this one document, and therefore it's self-describing. It mean, self that means I can just send the document over to somewhere else, and you know exactly what the attributes mean, what they stand for, etc. You don't need anything else from that. And you have a flexible schema, right? And this is usually referred to schema on read. Document A doesn't have to look like the same as document B. So I don't have a, a middle name, so my document doesn't have a middle name attribute. Somebody else has a middle name, it has a middle name attribute, and so forth. And sometimes people say, well, it's human and machine readable, but frankly, that's not a benefit. That's just bullshitting, really, or a good way to fill another po a bullet point on a slide. However, the self-containedness also comes with a downside, right? Because there's always trade-offs. Well, the data, metadata is duplicated, right? So every time you have you store another document, you at least duplicate the metadata, uh, sometimes also the data. And that means if you ever want to change something within the document, well, that becomes more cumbersome now, right? Especially if you want to change the metadata. If you say, well, it's no longer user ID, but user underscore ID and so forth. And usually you shouldn't care about that because you shouldn't have picked JSON in the first place for if you want to do something like that, right? But if you have picked JSON for whatever reason or hierarchical documents, then this is really, really bad. And same with flexible schemas. They actually bite you also further down the line if you have a lot of analytical workloads that now have to essentially understand what the JSON document resembles, right? Because we have a flexible schema. So one document may be user ID, the other one may be user underscore ID, the other one may be user uppercase I, D, and it's like, is it all the same? Are they different? Who knows? What if they are both in there, right? And so all of this has to basically be understood by the application that's reading the JSON document later on. And more importantly, every time, because it's schema on read. So every time you read it again, you have to do all this overhead again and again. And there's a risk of becoming a dumping ground, I call it. So that basically means, because it's schema on read, you can put in anything what you like on the on the writing side without necessarily validating what comes along. So as the years go by, and if you're not careful, you may end up with a lot of those JSON documents where you have like user ID, user underscore ID, user uppercase ID, and so forth, because you didn't enforce any sort of uh, uh, checks uh, or different versions of the applications with bugs and so forth. And it's very, very difficult to actually uh, clean that up again. Good usage for documents, data transfer. Perfect. Basically, stateless communications. I think everybody's aware of that. Uh, anything where it's the data is relatively static and self-contained in its nature, so where it forms natural aggregates in itself, right? They don't depend on any other data. Typical examples: REST, right? HTTP calls, REST calls, and so forth. Data transfer, stateless communication. Everything's encapsulated. Product catalogs. Products are in and self-encapsulated. In a sense, like if I have a book that may has an ISBN, that may has an author and so forth, but if another product that I'm actually selling is a bike, it may have a color, it may have wheels and so forth. They're very different in beasts, but I have this all encapsulated into one document that look very, very different. Downsides of it, well, if you want to update parts of the data or the data regularly. JSON is actually really, really bad if you ever want to update uh, uh, parts of the document in it because the stores are not uh, laid out for that, right? So you can do it, uh, but you probably want to look at something else to do so. 
If you have many downstream systems consuming a data, same thing as with key value, essentially, you have to, those downstream systems have to, every time they read, make, uh, figure out what's going on, what does the JSON document so, uh, look like, the structure looks like, does it make sense to me or not? And anything that doesn't have natural aggregates, right? It's, uh, basically, those are the things where it's like, oh, we have to join across five different collections now because parts of the data is over in that document and parts is over there and there. Kind of you did it wrong at the beginning there. Third one, probably one of the uh, also well-known ones is relational, right? This is there for ages, so certainly for me, I kind of grew up with that out of school. Same data again, just in a table, right? Uh, we can store the picture as binary there, and the biggest change here that we have is actually we have two tables already. Before we had essentially one document, we had a bunch of key values. Here now we have two tables because we actually uh, normalize the latitude and la uh, longitude out into a separate table and then just relate via an ID to it. That is one benefit that we could have out of that is when we actually look up the longitude and latitude, we will figure out it's actually right here where we are right now. So if we all were to enter a record into the first table, we don't have to repeat the longitude and latitude. One of the benefits that the relational schema gives, uh, the relational model gives us. But in general, it's the well-defined schema. Right, so there's no need to retain the knowledge of the incoming data. So like if you get a documents, uh, JSON document in, you store the JSON document, you will always have to deal with that original format as you store the, the JSON document, which was decided by the system sending you the JSON document, not, not by you. Relational, other way around. You basically decide what the format is like and you don't have to, you know, in tables and columns and you don't have to retain any of this knowledge. Schema is enforced on write. If it doesn't conform, it doesn't go in as simple as that and that's usually known as schema on write. Very, very good for analytics, right? Because as you, with the relational uh, model, as you normalize it out into different tables, you basically can slice and dice the data very differently. So if I just want to read the longitude and latitude, uh, la longitude and latitudes, I don't have to touch the people table and vice versa and so forth. Same downside here as well, right? Everywhere is trade-off, well-defined schema. That means that incoming data must conform to the schema. If it doesn't, it doesn't go in. As simple as that. You're done, right? It stops right there. You get some unit key violations, some constant violation, whatever. And it's harder to onboard new data sources because, well, if now your data source looks completely different, you essentially will have to change your schema first to reflect the change before you can store it. ORM overhead, well known. You basically have to take whatever you have and model it into rows and different tables. And if you want to construct an object back into your application, you have to read from many different tables and join them back together to get essentially the object back. And then sometimes people say schema is hard to change. I actually call bullshit on that because every relational database has an order table add or drop column. It's mostly just because there is many, many different systems that are downstream there and that are reading from that. And so if you change it, you would just break everything. But if you would have the same case with a JSON document store, it would be uh, true as well. Usage, uh, many, many systems that share basically the data or want to access the data uh, when you have very different read workloads. So like my reporting is very different from somebody else's reporting or they want to do some more sophisticated analysis like give me all my customers over the last 12 months, over the last two minutes, whatever products they bought and so forth, very easy with SQL. And the usual examples, right? Financial services, CRM systems, warehouses, and so forth and so forth. Where you don't want to use it is anywhere where you want to cache the data, basically, right? Don't abuse it as a caching store. Those are usually things that you will see as single table workloads. If all you ever do is like, oh, I have an ID in the blob where I store my JSON in or something like that, well, yeah, it wouldn't belong in the relational table to begin with or anything else where you would just keep on appending to that, uh, to that table. Doesn't really belong into relational. Last is graphs, slightly different there as well. Here we have essentially nodes and relationships between nodes that allow us to find or figure out how th different things are related or different entities are related. Benefits of that, really, really easy to find those relationships, right? It's kind of like walking the graph. We know it all from LinkedIn, like I know that person over this person. You basically start with my entity. Who do I know? Do I know people that know people? And also really easy to find hidden relationships that's visualizing the graph. So, for example, we are all connected if we would model ourselves in a graph by we are all attending DevFox Belgium. So we would find that very easily if we would just visualize that graph. Downsides, pretty much anything that's not to do with finding relationships between entities because it's very cumbersome or impractical to model that data in, in graphs. So, like, don't do financial transactions in graphs, for example. Use cases, I just mentioned LinkedIn, you know, Facebook, social media, et cetera, but also recommendations, engines, people who bought products, who bought products, who might be interested and so forth, fraud detection and so forth. And again, downside anything that's not really uh, related to relationships between entities or, 
you don't want to do relationships between entities. Last two slides I want to take away with is like scheme on read versus scheme on write. There's the misconception that basically there is a, you can avoid the scheme on write overhead. That's not quite true. It actually only shifts to the scheme on read. So for key value, it's very easy to get data into your data store because it's just bytes. But you will have to figure out later on whether those bytes were an image, were a JSON document, were whatever, a string. It gets a bit easier with documents. You basically just model it into a JSON document. And then uh, the application downstream has to figure out where the JSON document conforms, so it's the format that you want. And as, as you go all the way down, with relationals, it's very difficult on schema on right to actually get data in. You have to make sure that it fits into the schema and so forth. But it is easy to read the data. The model is all known. And don't forget, there is actually two approaches to polyglot persistence. A single model where if one database that does one data store, but actually one data format, but actually there's many, many other uh, or all the major players, whether it's MySQL, SQL Server, Oracle, Postgres, they actually can store more than just relational as well. So if you just want to store JSON or something like that for modeling it that way, you may not have to introduce a new data store just yet. Be a bit more cautious so that you avoid what I showed on slide four. Most important slide, my first talk ever of DevOx. I enjoyed it very much. If you enjoyed it, please give me a good rating. If you didn't enjoy it, please give me a good rating anyway. And thank you very much.